Welcome to Drinking Bros, presented by GhostBed.com. Welcome to Drinking Bros Podcast. D'Anthony, we got a special guest today. Yeah, we sure do. Uh, who, who do we got on the show today? We have uh, General, I hope I'm saying this right, Clay Huttmacher. You got it. Yeah, right away. He is a former uh, member of the U.S. Armed Forces, right? A number uh, of them. He was in the Marine. Are we allowed to say or no? Sure. He started out in the Marine Corps, and then he worked for 160th Soar for a while. Okay. Right? So if you remember 160th Soar, I guess now they're pretty famous because of the Black Hawk Down movie, right? And mm-hmm. then the various other movies. But, uh, you know, been around for a while. They're the best of the best when it comes to pilots of any kind, right? Particularly uh, rotary wing. In the world? I would say yes. I don't know anybody else that could compete with these guys. I mean, if you combine the expertise plus the hardware that America has, mm-hmm. like the, the, the aircraft that he flew, for example, I can't imagine anybody being able to compete with that. Like a hind, maybe, but yeah, I, still I, probably not. Yeah, I think our uh, air refueling capability, our reach, mm-hmm. uh, but, you know, and... At the, at the end of the day, it's the human, it's the, mm-hmm. it's the pilot, the crew chief, you know, that are making decisions on the fly. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I'm biased, of course, mm-hmm. but uh, if you want to, I think, I think you would be hard pressed to find another aviation unit uh, that specially assesses and selects pilots and keeps them. Uh, we've had pilots uh, flying the same missions for 20 years in that organization and never leave and so. I, I like the brass. I like the hubris on you where you're like, right. yeah, dude, I'm the fucking best in the if world. If you can see the goddamn. <laughs> well, I didn't say I'm the best, right? Those guys <laughs> carried me. I was, uh, I was a weak link. If so. you can see the DAP, the, uh, the aircraft that he flew, we'll get a picture of it here. I'll send you one, uh, uh, Bob. It's called the MH60 Direct Action Penetrator. And you want to find the one with the most amount of weapons on it because that's the one he flew. Um, Man, I'm looking at it now. That thing is gnarly. It is dude. not fucking around, my man. Wow. Yeah. There you uh, go. What, 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 what years up. were you in? Was I in the 160th? Mm-hmm. Uh, I got to the 160th in February 1988 as a uh, platoon leader. And I wrapped up my last tour with them as a regimental commander in May, June of 2010. So you saw oh. some shit. I was there at a good time. So I got there when we were... Uh, doing the what we call the uh, Operation Prime Chance, where they reflagged the Kuwaiti tankers to U.S. Mm-hmm. and the Iranians were laying mines. So we were operating off of Navy ships and some uh, uh, afloat-based platforms interdicting the Iranians. So I did that, uh, three tours doing that. We rolled right into Operation Just Cause in Panama. Mm-hmm. I was fortunate to get on that. That was 89, right? Yeah, 89 yeah. into 90. And that was Rangers, Christmas 89. Noriega? Some, Ran- Noriega. some Rangers yeah. and some 82nd yeah, Airborne pineapple guys. Pineapple Delta face. guys, yeah. I mean, it was a... Yeah. That- 75th jumped in yep. to two locations, Rio Hato, which was Noriega one of his base of operations, and then Tarias Tucuman, uh, the main airfield, the, mm-hmm. the international airport. And while he was holed up uh, and they were doing siege warfare... They played Metallica to get him to come they the fuck did. out. That's what I was going to say. I, so, did you, how long was it? Wasn't it three I days? I can't or remember. Like that? I wasn't, you know, days? I wasn't, uh, I flew guys in and out. There was a soccer field near the Papal Annuncia where he was holed up mm. uh, in the, uh, in the uh, Catholic, that Catholic uh, enclave mm. there. Um, but I know one time I was flying by and, uh, we, and we had just shut down uh, the aircraft in a soccer field and I could hear him playing. Uh, I fought the law and the law won. <laughs> <laughs> it was awesome. That's really funny. <laughs> that was cool. Look, yeah. just because it sucks doesn't mean you can't have fun. Yeah. You know what I mean? Exactly. Exactly. What, what did you think was going to happen there? Because that, that was a massive story. It was. It was, you know, if you think about how complex that operation was, you know, H hour was 01 in the morning mm-hmm. on December 20th. Mm-hmm. We hit 27 separate targets simultaneously, all under night vision goggles, and that was night vision goggle technology. Those are PBS sevens back then, right? Well, for the ground guys, we were running uh, Anvis sixes at the time, probably Gen ones or Gen Mm. twos. Mm. Uh, But to do all those hits in an urban environment simultaneously, I mean, that was pretty. I mean, that was a pretty significant lift. And and, and to my knowledge, um, just recounting that event, it went off without a hitch. Like it it wasn't. Yeah. I mean, the op was good. You know, there was one operation to rescue Kurt Muse, who was held in a prison in downtown Panama. I still keep in touch with him to this day. He wrote a book, Six Minutes to Freedom, which is a great, uh, great book about uh, what happened to him. Um, We did crash a bird. We got a bird shot down coming off the Mm. roof of the prison. (laughs) Mm. Um, But uh, just. I mean, it was a great mission. Went on, you know. I mean, it was, 
to be honest with you, I think the shooting was pretty much done in about 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I remember getting on the C5, leaving there thinking, man, it is not going to get any better than this. I got to, you know, this is the biggest mm -hmm. thing we've done since Vietnam. I mean, that's, that, yeah, seriously, yeah, yeah, that yeah, was, right. that, that is, at the time, that may have been the most successful special operations mission. Well, first hostage rescue in modern right. history. Well, right? I mean, we tried it in Operation Eagle Claw, and that right. went tits we up. up. Like Delta, the they didn't plan right, the birds sucked yeah. in shit. Which is why the 160 I mean, was created, by yeah, the way, exactly. because the helicopters were the uh, point of failure on mm -hmm. that. So yeah. it wasn't the first big, I mean, I guess Grenada, there was some stuff there, but Grenada, not yeah. at scale, right? Not like not this. A, not, a, not like that. And then, you know, right after that. I mean, that's, uh, that is a good point, though. You got the opportunity to take part in that mission that the unit was fucking created for, the first one yes. that it was created for. That's amazing. Yeah, that, that was awesome. And then, you know, right after that, Desert Storm happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I was flying DAPS, and we got brought in. Pull that up on the screen, guys. This is DAPS, so tell us about this aircraft before we get into your story. Okay, it's a... Uh, this is a fucking right. death machine. And now, yeah. I, will, I got to caveat that up front. We never... The, you see on the outboard stations on those wings, those are uh, Stinger missiles. Mm -hmm. And that was an option that we never used. Our mission wasn't air-to-air, -air, it was air-to-ground. Right. But this was a demo that we could, um, you know, we could mount those. Right, so if you didn't have Stingers on yours, what would have been there? Just more... Well, fire. so generally we run, uh, we have two sets of wings, those mm -hmm. wings where you have four stations, or what we generally run is just a set of wings uh, with two stations, one on each side. See, I, I was in the military and I didn't know that. I'm not even kidding. I didn't know that was, I didn't know there were two different sets of fucking wings. Yeah. Well, that you think those are made originally for refueling. So you or not refueling, but external tanks, mm. right? Like so external you could go, fuel yeah. tanks. Right. Yeah. And so, you, you know, so uh, if you, we'll start right to left. So on okay. the right, you got the stingers out there. We never use those, never employed them operationally. Next station in is um, two Hellfires. That's a rack that carries four, mm -hmm. which we normally would. And, you know, different types of Hellfires. You got an anti-tank Hellfire, but then you also have a Blast Frag. Tell, which, me, tell me about the Blast Frag Hellfire. So the Blast Frag, uh, uh, the problem with an anti-tank first, and all mm -hmm. that why, is... You know, that's made to go through heavy armor mm -hmm. and then send a spall, send spall into the turret of a tank, for instance. Spall is, is, is like shrapnel, molten. Yeah, it's right. really molten yeah. steel that goes in there. The problem when you're shooting buildings or semi-hard structures, especially a regular building, a hellfire will go right through it. Correct, I mean, yeah. an anti-tank hellfire will just yeah. be like, hey, what the hell was that? It just, it just punches through. Like, you right. can't, it'd be like shooting an RPG at a door to blow it up or something like that. Or more, I guess an AT-4 is a better example. Cause right, it'd go right through. through. Yeah. So the blast frag is made to go in and blow and clear a room, mm. not take down a tank. Then there's also a thermal barracks. So those are good for reducing uh, weapons caches and mm. things like that. So you put them in there and you get a, you get an overpressure, drop the roof right. on a building. And it burns at like 2,600 degrees or some shit like that. It's crazy. Yeah, it is. I, and I, I would not quote that. We started, we started shooting thermal barracks uh, long after I was wiggling the sticks on those things. I was flying a desk or sitting in the jock, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. watching them and have fun. 2,200, excuse me. Not, not being able to use those stingers. Uh, well, that's for air-to-air, that, air, though, right? I, yeah, it's I, like I we've stand. Tim, but, Ken, Tim yeah. Kennedy says this all the time. He, he's, at, especially as a special forces operator, but for conventional forces in general, Americans have had air, for our generation, we've always had air superiority. Supremacy, like really. Like supremacy, yeah, supremacy, yeah, of course. For, like, we wouldn't know what it would be like to have to do air-to-air -air combat at this point. I mean, obviously, the guys yeah. are trained for it, but, I mean, that would be weird for it to happen at this point. But isn't it like showing up at a party with a bottle of Pappy Van Winkle and you don't get to have a sip? Like, don't you just want to unleash wanna. the... Listen, are you asking me, is it my <laughs> lifelong dream to shoot down another aircraft? Yes, of course it is. Absolutely. There kidding? we go. I mean, are you kidding me? I mean, I would be... That's I like mean, a stateside kill for me. There'd be like a me. bronze statue of me <laughs> in front of the 160 that I shot down. When's the a, last air-to-air -air, uh, confirmed kill for an American pilot? Oh, a Desert Storm. Yeah. Mm. No, 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 no. Uh, Bosnia, I think. Oh, that's true. Really there 90s, there yeah. was like a MiG twenty nine or something. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and I think they clipped that guy. But so I there's think been that was the last there's one. been like a handful in the last thirty years. Yeah, yeah, but it's a testimony. I mean, people don't want to go against the U.S. Air Force, exactly. right? Yeah. Which I mean, is great. Yes, yeah. it is great. Which is great. It's and one then, of the best deterrents in, in the military. Of any military in the world is yeah, our absolutely. fucking. Hey, they listen. We're, we got the best Air Force yeah. on the planet. Yep. Looks like we might have shot down a Syrian plane. Oh, really? Air-to-air -air combat. I found this on uh, military.com in 2017. For, good for that. Oh, I think you're right. Oh, 2017. There you I go. That's amazing. Right. Yeah. I forgot about that. So there's been good three catch. or yeah, four yeah. of them in the last 30 years. Yeah. One. So just think about it. You shoot down an aircraft, you're a fighter pilot. I mean. Boom. 
Yeah. You're, you're the, the only one. You're the man. That's the I biggest mean, I, dick in yeah. the room. Yeah. yeah. I, I, you're the I, only one. It's I like, get it tattooed on my bicep. <laughs> yeah. I would get it on the small of my back. Yeah. You would. Yeah. So you, Just because I would make them stare at my ass in the small of my back wall and be like, I'm a, be, I'm a better man than you, and you have to stare at my ass so I can prove it to you. <laughs> Nothing you can yeah. do. You can never fucking do anything. That's a this. statement. It I'm is. not sure how significant it is, well, but it is a statement. <laughs> we, like to get, we like to get weird here. Yeah. So you <laughs> went over to Iraq after. Yeah. Um, and of course, ha- Yeah, but with, with the Iraq thing, that was so a big. So we're talking was, Desert yeah. Storm? That was a oh, big yeah. mission, and it, and it ended so quickly. Yeah, when we were really divorced from the uh, ground campaign, I mean, we were way over in the western. We were near the Jordanian border, so we were we were way out west. And our mission was deep, uh, going after those scuds being shot mm-hmm. into Israel to keep Israel from coming into the war. Because remember that that would have broke up the coalition, right? Yep. Right? Because the Arab yep. nations, the Syrians, were actually on our side on that one. And so that was our mission, and uh, pretty effective. Uh, you know, they stopped shooting them once we uh, got over there. Yeah. I mean, it was probably the toughest flying I've ever done. I really? mean, sandstorms. Because of sand, and, yeah, I yeah, I mean, they just come out of nowhere. I mean, I mean, not only for visibility, but it, they, there's a lot of wear and tear on the, yeah. on the, on the machine itself. And we have no, we had, at that time, we had no autopilot, no altitude hold, no nothing. So, so you can just set your on, trim and sit there? You, no, you can't do that. Holy and, shit. And it, I mean, yeah, so it's it's hands on flying the whole time. I mean, we and we'd fly I don't know six eight hours, and by the time I came back, I mean I was spent. That's crazy. Yeah. And everybody was. It wasn't just me. Cliff Walcott, it was mm-hmm. killed in Somalia. Yep. I flew his wing. Um, I would have to Jeremy Piven. Yeah, 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 exactly. In Black Hawk Town, yeah. which we'll get to after yeah, this. Yeah. But um, uh, just thinking about that, we were talking about the sand and flying what four to six. That's hours? That's like two NASCAR yeah. races. In back a row, back, basically, yeah. where you I mean, can't see shit, and man. everything else, I would have to imagine mentally you were exhausted just because you're trying to it. focus your eyes. Exactly, and with and it's we had always flew, we tried to always fly uh, zero illumination, mm-hmm. so that you know the enemy can't see us. Right. But the problem is, it's the night vision goggles Green and you're out of the middle of desert. You know those things work on light amplification, mm-hmm. so there's no light to amplify. There, you know, you're looking. At nothing. I mean, you're you're trying to use moon and starlight to amplify exactly. at that point, and it is not always yeah. the best, right? No, it was yeah. it was black, and then you fly, you know, inadvertently you fly into a sandstorm, and you're trying to fly formation. I was all we were always dashed too, mm-hmm. so you got to fly relative off lead, and that's you know, it's a little adds to it. Hey, I'll wrap up the DAP. So if you look on each side of the cockpit you see those mini guns they're hard to see they're Is it not the, on the, the wings. tan looking ones there? I see, yeah, yeah on the end yeah. right right there you're right yeah. over with the cursor so those are 762 mini guns they shoot at a cyclic rate of fire of either 2,000 or 4,000 rounds a minute so those are more close in work wow. and then you move out to the next station on the left side as you're looking at it that's a 30 millimeter cannon the m230 that's your main gun that's the uh yeah that's a great gun yeah, that's the same gun that's on the apache mm-hmm. we just rotated at 90 90 degrees and mounted it on a turtle back good lord man uh you don't see the, the shoot for it that feeds the ammo comes out of the uh comes out of the uh cabin in the back right but 600 rounds per minute cyclic rate of fire, lethal bursting radius per round. If my memory serves me correct, I could be wrong. And I know there's some warrant officer out there ready to uh, sharpshoot me, but I believe <laughs> it is. And I'm a former warrant, so mm. feel free. Uh, three to five meters per. So I'm sorry. Per so piece, per this per is, per per a, this is a 30 millimeter round, which isn't, t- frankly, too much smaller than this. Mm-hmm. We're not sponsored by White Claw. No, I want to say that's, yeah. <laughs> but the the... The lethal radius of that round is three to five meters. Yes, that it, so it's got a serrated wire wrap, and there's different warheads. You know, if you're shooting blue spears or just blue, they're inerts. But if you're shooting a legitimate, there's an explosive uh, charge in that warhead, and it's serrated wire, so it gives you a uniform breakup on a shrapnel Holy pattern. Holy shit! That's so it's crazy. So it's air burst, and then it's just sea wire everywhere yeah i mean that's it is a destruction. exceptional fuck. gun i yeah. mean it is an exceptional <laughs> gun. holy shit uh, and then that's another set of uh stingers on the outboard store yeah. on the left side the underneath the nose is a FLIR turret mm-hmm. right above it is a weather radar um that's an older version that's an older that was back in the time when i was flying mm-hmm. how much does one of those one things cost by the way uh Fucking that one a lot. i don't know i would say a current dap which is the uh, Mike model. Mm-hmm. That's an L, probably L, A or L, probably an L. Um, 
They're somewhere north of 20 million a tail. Mm. And, and, and you know that going up each and every time. Does that ever weigh on your mind of like, oh man, if I fuck this up, that's $20 million? Hey, listen, when I was a 160th commander, we lost three aircraft in one week. Two oh, Chinooks oh, damn. and a DAP. And uh, I was like, so you're not getting that. And I was, I was literally like a couple of weeks out from command. Oh shit! And I'm like, the change of command. I'm like, uh, dude, really? You couldn't give this to the new guy? Yeah, seriously. So we had a Chinook that uh, browned out in Afghanistan, yeah. ripped the gear off, and that one we were able to depopulate it, which means take the engines off mm -hmm. and all that. And a 53, the Marines squared us away, okay. swung it out. The other one was too high, so we had to blow that one in place. Mm. And then we had a DAP on a mission in Helmand Province get hit with an RPG and crash. The crew got out. The wingman landed right next to him, pulled him out. And it was funny. So I was over getting my household goods appointment mm. uh, squared away because I was getting ready to change command. And my deputy call, you know, texts me on my BlackBerry and says, I think you need to get over to the office. We got an aircraft down. So I, you know, hopped in my car, drove around the airfield. And we could see it, you know, through the internet on V-Brick, we could mm. see the airplane uh, from overhead ISR sitting on the ground. And the ground force commander, they kept trying to get to it, and it was, they were just in heavy contact, mm. and they couldn't get to it. And they say, I think we need to blow it up. And I'm like, no, 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 don't blow up my aircraft. <laughs> yeah, right? I mean, yeah. these things are like 23 just, million just bucks. Give me five minutes. Yeah, that's a hell of a report of survey there. So I, uh, I asked them how to shoot it, and then right then in the picture comes an RPG and uh, hit it and blew it up and i was like well go ahead now <laughs> so, yeah. i mean you hit that with a thermobaric so you melt down all the comps yeah, so you right? yeah you take it out but mm. that was three in one week boy uh, but i will tell so you you didn't get that quarterly bonus then yeah no yeah i was uh, i was not at the top of my game uh on that one yeah that was uh you know, you got good days of command and bad days, but I take the good, I take the bad and do it all over again if I could. But yeah, but luckily, hey, the fortunate thing was, um, we didn't lose anybody in any three. Mm, so we had some injuries, great. but we yeah. didn't lose anybody. That's great. Um, uh, with the Iraq thing, uh, just from a civilian perspective on that, was it as easy as it looked on the news? Because it looked like they were just running out with white flags, in surrendering. Desert Storm and, now? Yes. Are we, are we yeah. into OIF? Yeah, Desert Storm, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, I would say it was that. I, I mean, I don't want to underplay. There's a lot of valor. There's a major tank bot battle that went on in the, mm -hmm. you know, out in the east. Yeah, the U.K. actually blew up some of our tanks. Did they? Yeah. Yeah, well, it doesn't some surprise me. I mean, it's just fog of war. I yeah, mean, yeah, I'm not sure. downplaying blue, it, but it's, no, yeah. Green on blue stuff happens all the yeah, time. Yeah, all the time. Uh, especially in a fast-moving, dynamic mm. environment with, you know, you don't have a linear battlefield. you got right. units that are surging ahead. Mm. Um, but it looked, I mean, it went about as well as it could go. And I think our adversaries took a lot of notes on that, right? Yeah. I mean, hey, the U.S. went through... Iraqi's army like a hot knife through butter. because it, it was looked, like 45 days right Ara so yeah. not even Ara not no even. it was it was 28 days I think but so oh I, really yeah I think uh you can you can look yeah look it up hot but it's it's Iraq remember was coming off of this long Iraq Iran Iraq war right mm -hmm. yeah uh Hussein had come to power and dominated the area although what we come to find out is that the southern regions of Iraq he didn't have really good military control down there kind of like the, the outlier Russian states back during the Cold War. Like, those, those generals could be handled. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I mean, honestly, if you showed up in Russia with enough money, they would become whatever you wanted them to become. You know what I mean? Right. I don't know if it was like that in, in, in Iraq, but they were so institutionalized there that anybody could come flip them, really. So it, it's, it was a weird situation. It's, it's why, like, he's talking about a nonlinear uh, battlefront yeah. meaning some units are up here but these other guys are up here and right here's enemies so you can get flanked and all mm -hmm. kinds of fucked up shit can happen it's happening politically there as well that's why these afghan and iraq wars are, are fucking dumb and why our execution has been dumb because we're trying to fight like an ideological linear war and it's not like that you right know what i mean mm -hmm. right. that's why we keep failing at this shit because we fail to realize the dynamics that are involved in this shit and well, it's been going on for a long time since he since he started basically. Yeah, and and that's kind of where I was going with this because you know based on the years that that you were doing all of this, you guys end up going back to Iraq again. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm sure you didn't like the last thing you wanted to do after leaving 
Desert Storm and then doing Mogadishu and then maybe Bosnia and yeah. all that shit. Yeah, I wasn't in Mogadishu. I was involved in the periphery, which mm-hmm. we can talk about, but mm-hmm. I, I wasn't there. My platoon was there, but I'd already Why does it mean left. for the military yeah. at large yeah, to yeah, get involved yeah, yeah, in all this yeah. stuff? And then the stuff in, in the Baltic states that we had to deal with for a while. And even, I mean, we ran sorties against Iraq in, what, 95, 96, and 97, I believe. Mm-hmm. Well, we had or Northern Watch up there. Yeah. Where we yeah. No fly zones. Yeah. And, and then uh, there was the USS Cole situation. There was a lot going on. I, I'm sure that you personally didn't want to find find yourself back in fucking Iraq again. Like, yeah, and, and, and is there any part of you that was like, man, I wish we would have took out Hussein the first time and, and ended it, or? I think it was a mistake to take him out and, at all, to be honest. Yeah. Look at the result of that. I, I, I agree, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts mm-hmm. on it, because you were there. Well, so, first of all, did I, did I think we should have taken Hussein out? I mean, let's, you know, my station in life was a lieutenant. I mean, my job was to fly an airplane, so. <laughs> right. You know, I wasn't exactly a strategic thinker on all that. Schwarzkopf, I was not on his, uh, you know, his uh, speed down. Speed yeah. down yeah. <laughs> so uh, I did meet him once. He came and visited us, uh, and he was a, he's a mountain of a guy. He was a fucking man. He's a big guy. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, uh, and you know, did a great job. I mean, I don't mm-hmm. think you could take anything away from that. Nope. Um, so, you know, Saddam Hussein taking him out. Mm-hmm. My my read, um, too soon to tell, okay? If you look, I mean, if we establish some sort of democracy, if that lose, if that re- the overturning of that regime creates some sort of democracy, remember this, you know, you've got a bunch of really oligarch kind of mm. organizations there um, around the countries, you know, all in the Middle East. To me, I think it's, uh, that could be, the impetus for change mm. in the region. I think, and I don't, I, you know, again, George Bush didn't have on his, me on his speed dial either mm-hmm. later mm-hmm. during OIF, but I've read, you know, Condoleezza Rice's books, uh, s- several books, and I think there was a thought that if you're able to establish some sort of democratic government in Iraq, that it would cause change through the region. Right. Now, you know, those things are always ugly at first, and I mean, you know, it's, it took us, our democracy is pretty frustrating, right? Yeah. And I tell people, you know, Jeffersonian democracy is a horrible form of government. It just happens to be slightly better than every other one. Right. Um, so for a country to go from, you know, total control by the government to a functioning democracy, I mean, it's going to be a journey, not a destination. I think it's a journey <laughs> for the U.S., right? Yeah, the tree of liberty, right? Must right. be refreshed so, yeah. from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. Jefferson said that for a reason. He did. This and isn't supposed to be easy. So my, my read on was Saddam Hussein should be taken out? Yeah, I mean, I think the guy was a bad man. He killed thousands of people. Uh, I think he was crimes against humanity. That's mm. Clay Huttmacher's opinion. Did it get us what we want? Again, too soon to tell. Right, but it, there's this is something we've employed in a in a more dynamic way in the past, right? Uh, the idea, the idea that the max our, our macro premise that introducing democracy to Iraq would spread through the region. The micro version of that is to introduce just the idea of self determinism and democracy and individual liberty to the people of Iraq, and because right. pe- it worked in Iran until we fucked it up. Iran was getting away from all that bullshit, and even now. 80 some percent of their sub 20 or are 28 and younger people are pro West. They don't want to deal with that bullshit. They want to live their lives yeah. and have fun. I've like heard the same. Else. I mean, yeah. I can't swear that it's true, but I've heard the same. But this is, yeah, I mean, it's research yeah. I did back in college. So it's yeah. five, six, six, seven years old yeah. now, but who knows what it is now. But um, we did this in, uh, and we've been doing it in North Korea for a long time, piping internet access into North yeah. Korea so they can find out that there's a world other than North Korea. So yeah. they don't think we're fucking alien invaders when we do finally have to show up there, right? That, yeah. that, when people find out there's another option than what they're dealing with right now, even if in reality it's not a better option, that, that grass is always greener mentality comes in and they're like, fuck this, I'm gonna go try it, right? That's a powerful weapon. Yeah. It's a lot more powerful than a bunch of white faces in a country mm-hmm. full of brown faces, in my opinion. Yeah. So I, just the handling of all this, we fucked it up in completely. Yeah. Well, what I would say, I did a year in Korea from uh, 2014 to 2015. I was what the, was that like? Uh, I was a deputy commanding general of 2nd Infantry Division over oh, there. Oh, shit. 
and uh, so that that I think that internet push mm -hmm. and uh, I mean that's doing been those going balloons. on for like yeah, but that's I think that's the something? Koreans that are doing most of that. Yeah, South Koreans. Are um, right. South Koreans are doing that. Um, you know, they uh, a funny story when I was over there. Do you remember uh, what was the name of that movie? The Interview. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. So. Um, Nobody would publish it because it was that, well. They, that the movie South is Koreans were putting uh, CDs in these hot air balloons oh, God. when the winds are right. Are and you sending serious? them into North Korea? No way. Oh, so yes. it, it, for those of you at home who don't know or God, what happened, um, so at Sony, uh, Seth Rogen and James <laughs> Franco shot this movie called The Interview about yeah. going over there to to kill Kim Jong Un. Yeah, uh, right. he was pissed and offended by that. Uh, he got a group of hackers from North Korea yep. to hack into Sony. Um, not only steal the movie, but steal all of the emails um, from the head mm -hmm. of the studio, which involved Angelina Jolie, all the most famous people in Hollywood. Oh, yeah. And Sony yeah. caved. Yes. Oh, they caved bad. But Netflix said, you know what? We don't give a fuck about North Korea. Yeah. Give me, the, give me they, the dollars. So they, they pulled the movie. Yeah. Um, she lost her job. That ruined, yeah. a, it ruined a, a, a lot of careers. But it shouldn't have because and that they ended up making a ton of money on Netflix with this movie. Tons Pot of money. Potentially. You, you'll never know what it came out, like what, it, what the box office would yeah. have done with it. Um, I enjoyed the movie. The fact that a dictator, though, was so pissed off and was able to oh, hack yeah. into. And then now think about it. Now the Koreans are putting salt in the wound, right? They're sending CD copies. That's CD, yeah, yeah, DVDs. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, yeah. I was previously unaware of this, and now that I'm so fucking happy with what happened. <laughs> that is so goddamn. Because yeah. we've done weird psyop shit over the years. We used to uh, put like uh, pictures of really buff dudes and 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 uh, in a bag, a little plastic bag with fucking extra large Magnum condoms with a little note in it to tell Russian women on the, on the, in the hinterland of Russian that American men had bigger dicks. That's a real operation that happened back in the fucking early 1980s. Well, it's right? true too. But. Yeah. My, <laughs> one, one of my, one of my uh, professors was a, uh, an air force pilot and he was telling me about this stuff. And I'm like, did you guys just get high and sit around and feel, you know what we should do today? Let's fuck with them, man. Hell yeah. Like, how did you even come up with this shit? But this one, <laughs> Is a good idea. That's a great yeah, one. We should just start producing content specifically driven towards making this guy lose his mind. I th I think it's probably going on, and we just don't know about it. But I want to watch the movie. It's yeah. fucking. This was a. I, it was actually a that whole thing where they're singing uh, the the uh, Katy Perry song and shit is so fucking funny. That it's movie a, a, is really good. It's a really funny movie. Damn it's a really it. funny movie. Yeah, it is. Uh, Even um, funnier now that I know that it was used to troll one of the leaders. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, a movie man. that that wasn't so funny was Black Hawk Down. Yeah, which yeah. Uh, you said you were um, on the periphery of. Well, so I wasn't. I wasn't deploy. I wasn't part of Task Force Ranger, mm -hmm. right? Um, so make that clear. I uh, I had just left after um, Desert Storm. I had left the platoon. I was actually flying with the Air Force as an exchange pilot down at Hurlburt at Air Force mm -hmm. Special Ops Command. Um, uh, Mike's wife. Uh, the day he was shot down, called me that morning, uh, October 3rd, 1993, and said, you know, Mike's missing. Because remember, initially, most people don't know this, for a few hours, he was just missing. Right. Everybody, <laughs> you know, uh, several people from the crash site, Ray Frank, uh, Bill Cleveland, uh, those, you know, they were obviously, they're, they were drugged through the streets. Mm. But Mike, we didn't know. I thought, to be honest, I thought he was dead. And I was, I... I just went up. To, I, you know, took leave immediately. Called my boss. Said, "Hey, I got to go up there." Mm. And I, my whole goal was to take care of, you know, make sure his family was taken care right. of. I knew they would be, but just be there right. for him because I knew he'd do that for me. Mm -hmm. When I got up there, I found out that he was still alive. Wait, this timeline is uh, interesting. So, in in the obviously the films are never correct, but even in the book, the the lag time between when Gordon and Sugar went down to down there what's that look like can you go through the time uh well again i wasn't there right. but they were there on the ground for a while in fact mike you know and, and he says it in his book um in the company of heroes mm -hmm. he says you know when when uh, they came up to, he would he could not get out of the seat so when they crashed you know they had lost the uh and this is aviation terminology mm -hmm. but the intermediate gearbox on the tail the whole tail not the tail boom but at the end where the black hawk tail goes right. up like this from that gearbox up the whole was thing gone. was gone so Shit. when they got it, they didn't it didn't happen right away but it hit 
uh, you know, they had that, that tail rotor turns that means you can't six times as fast as a main rotor. That means so, you can't control this. Anymore, right. right. So right. what happened was, and when you lose that much of the airplane, you get a shift of your center of gravity mm. forward. So the airplane, not only do they have no torque or no yaw control, but their nose down. now their nose down. Shit. And Mike told me that they were spinning so fast that centrifugal force was hampering them being able to reach up and pull the power. So the way you stop spinning is you take the power mm -hmm. off the engines, right? But they couldn't get, they got one. Your, your limbs physically you, couldn't go back yeah, there, right? Because That's of a centrifugal lot. force, yeah. G-forces, he got one, one, I think one back to idle mm -hmm. and one out of the fly detent. So, so part of the way back. And that was Ray Frank doing that yeah. when Mike was flying. So they hit. So it's a miracle any of these guys survived just the impact of the fucking crash. They did. Uh, and so when Mike hit, they were still spinning. Wow. And, you know, so in a Blackhawk, you sit in sort of a bucket, right? It's a ballistic bucket designed to take 762 mm, small arms under, fire. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, but so it goes down to about mid thigh. Mm -hmm. So think about it. So here's his, you know, so his, your, your knees bent. He hit with so much force, yaw, that his knee snapped around the side of that seat or his leg did so he broke his mm, femur mm. Holy and shit. uh his his the seats are designed in a black hawk those seats are designed to go down through the floor uh but they were that only works if you come straight down mm. if you're spinning those seats are on like shock absorbers so they get jammed up mm. Uh, with the yaw rate so his seat didn't go all the way down so his back was broken his leg was broken everybody else got out ray frank got mm -hmm. out uh, the crew chiefs were in the back, and he said he was sitting in the cockpit, and rounds were coming through the cockpit. Mm. He was—he should have been the first one killed, and then Shoe got because he was sitting up. You know, he's sitting mm. up high. He's elevated. He has no cover. Right. And then Shoe and Gordon pull him out and lay him in the dirt on the um, right side of the airplane. Uh, so there's a core, There's a tin wall. If you look in the book, you'll see the pictures of it. He there. So there was restricted access on his side. The, really, the open area was on the other side of the aircraft. That's another reason why he lived. Mm. And Mike said he's laying there, and he, you know, he's watching these guys get taken down one by one, and then they finally take out the rest of them. And Mike was down; he was out of ammo, so mm. he's just laying there with his M16. We yeah. were carrying M16A2. Oh, you didn't then. even have like an MP5 or anything? No. Well, uh, they had MP, they had an MP5, but their backup gun was a, uh, for the miniguns, the backup mm. was an M16. So everybody, he did have an MP5, which I'll be honest with you, I wasn't a big fan of those. They're mm. just not, and they never, 160th quit carrying them after What do they carry, the seven and something? M4. Oh, they carry an M4? Yeah. So um, he he had five rounds left. He got, those, once, once he was Winchester, he was out of ammo. He said he just laid there on his back. The M16 was laying across his chest, and uh, he wasn't liking his chances. Mm. I mean, yeah. And the crowd got him, and they wrapped a rag around his face. And his leg, when it was broke, while it was broken in the crash, it wasn't a compound fracture. They grabbed his leg and started twisting it, and Oof. the bone popped out the side of his uh, thigh. Jesus it became Christ. a compound fracture. And uh, This is after, so he got grabbed by the crowd after Randy and Gordon. Everybody were, was were killed on the crash site except and for those, him. Those and they guys, thought he was dead. What's the significance of wrapping a rag around the face? I, I think this is a crowd, right? They're just... They just, Doing I mean, whatever, somebody yeah. just didn't want him to see because they were surprised. They came up to him because they were going to loot the body. Oh, okay. And they saw that he was alive and they mm -hmm. like backed up. But and, that, those and then guys they overtook him. Those guys were up in the air on Overwatch, right? So, yeah. So, what happened was Super 6 1 with Cliff Walcott, mm -hmm. Donovan Briley, they were the two pilots. I both knew both of them. My middle son, who's getting ready to graduate college this year, is Mitchell Walcott Hupmonger. Mm -hmm. So, he's named Cliff and I. We we're in Panama together. Mm -hmm. We were in Desert Storm together. We were in the. I was his platoon leader, so we we're very close. But Super Six One got shot down first, right? And that's depicted in the movie. Mm -hmm. And then they brought in Super Six Four, Mike's bird, mm -hmm. to take up that position after they lost right. Super Six One. And you can debate the 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 value of that. You know, uh, not my place. I wasn't there, but. Um, then he got shot down and he said, I, you know, my intention, he told me was to go in and keep my speed up. Right. Trying right. harder to hit. Yeah, yeah. The problem is, is in, uh, it's Somali or Mogadishu is a shanty town. So the streets are very narrow mm. and to be able to see and provide cover. They had to get slow. They yeah. had to get slow just cause they, you know, they had time to see. And the guy that shot him down, they saw him, 
the guy, he, but the miniguns have a static stop, right? right? So you don't shoot yourself down. So what he did is he, as the aircraft came over, the guy on the left said, hey, I see him and they're waiting for the right door gunner to pick him up. But while that, while that, before that right door gunner, he came into his field of fire, he shot the RPG straight up and hit him. Or uh, not straight up necessarily, but hit him close range. So they're on the ground and, and Mike sees dudes going down and then Gordon and Sugar asked to be put on the ground. They did, three That's times. Who, this They had to ask three times and they didn't go down there with two four nine saws or M60s, they went down yeah, there with M14 an M4 and, and an M, M20, M4 and an M14. M14, yeah. Right. Right, with whatever ammo they had on them, they right. there's no these these are seasoned Delta operators. They knew they were going to die when they went down there. Right. Yeah, I think they. Cert- I don't know. I mean, I don't know that. I know that they thought there was risk for sure. I mean, obviously. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they didn't come. They didn't fast rope in right on top of them. They were mm-hmm. a, a bit away. Yeah. yeah, they had to. They had to work, fight their way to him. Yeah. And then they got there. And Mike told me when they came up to the side of the aircraft, he said he thought the cavalry was there. He said this is it. It's over. Mm-hmm. He didn't realize it was just two, two guys. Dudes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but they fought like lions. I mean, they both of them and were absolutely deserved the Medal of Honor. In fact, the foundation that I'm running now, the Special Ops Warrior Foundation, educated uh, Randy Shugart's kids. Were you married at the time? Uh, was I? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Does your wife? Because I mean, I, look, it was everywhere. Um, does your wife see something like that on the news? And, she and, won't watch and, that movie. Gotcha. Never watched it. As far I, I, as I was know, was where I was asking. Yeah. Does, does she? Does she ever? call and say hey why don't you pack it up and and come back like this she never did so i married an air force officer Mm. right ah there you go so um in fact i married her with the idea that the army would dominate the air force it really hasn't worked out like i thought (laughs) i remain a subordinate service to the air force Mm. to this day but um so she understood she did yeah yeah. and she you know look she's a uh, she she got out of the air force very promising career as an intel intelligence officer to raise our boys and uh and she's done a fantastic job um but she got it and she uh was always my decision when i made the decision to retire i mean i was over 40 years so i was basically working for free which she did remind me of that like you know like hey man why are you still doing this yeah Yeah. (laughs) she's like you know you get all this paid you don't even got to show up you got that right and i was like yeah what he means by working for free is he's his pension has reached a level where it's almost commensurate with what his active salary I actually got a pay raise when I retired. <laughs> <laughs> Not much. It was yeah, like 20 it. bucks so you a loved month. it that much. Hey, listen, I, you know, I came in when I was, you know, here's the deal. I was 17 years old, living in a foster home, and I was a high school dropout. And I joined the Marines. And I only joined the Marines because I was like, look, you're going nowhere fast. You know, you need a swift kick in the ass mm-hmm. to get back on track. I did not realize how big of a kick that was yeah. going to be, but uh, um, I did six and a half years in the Marines and, you know, got my high school diploma first, started going to college at night, qualified for Army flight training, got picked up for Which that. Which is, by the way, not easy to do. No, it was. Un- I, I mean, I felt like I won the Super Bowl. Yeah, <laughs> it's there. a I mean, big I fucking did. deal to get him. I was like Brady down. throwing the trophy yeah. on the yeah, boat yeah, yeah, parade yeah. in Tampa. You know? he, said, he did say that was the right move. That he, was the right he, read. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he said it was the right read. That's pretty. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah, guy was open. Yeah, um, but then uh, you know, and then I got into the 101st as a medevac pilot, my first tour, and I, I just, I realized, hey, I missed the leadership aspect of being an NCO, and I, you know, and the only way to really go for, at that point was commission. So I went to OCS. Mm-hmm. Again, uh, you know, my goal was, well, I got 10, almost 10 years in, I'll do another 10, maybe retire as a major if I'm lucky. I mean, I never thought I'd be a general officer. I mean, I'm still a little uh, mystified by the whole <laughs> yeah. thing, but uh, yeah. Yeah, so I a lot of stuff has to go right for you to become a general. Well, there was hey, listen, you know, it's better to be lucky than good. Exactly, so yeah. you know, um, but yeah, I got mm-hmm. into the special ops world, loved it. I apply, and I I was in officer candidate school with orders of the 82nd, and I called the 160th recruiter and I said, hey, you know, I'm already rated as an aviator. I really like to try out, and they said you got no shot, <laughs> but okay, we'll let you try. And I and I you know I made it and uh, I stayed there for years and years and and loved it. I mean, yeah being part of some great missions and doing some great stuff, I wouldn't turn back. I wouldn't do anything. Different. Obviously, if, if you're in for 40 years. and yeah. uh, uh, <laughs> At my retirement ceremony, my youngest son was 17. He was like three months younger than I was when I joined the service. Man, that's crazy. Yeah, right? It's crazy. 
Uh, so during all of this, uh, 9-11 happens. Right, yeah. Right yeah, I was in, uh, I was overseas on an exercise. What, like Saudi Arabia or some shit? Uh, Budapest. Oh, Budapest. Oh, yeah, that's a nice Europe. one. Yeah. That's actually a nice one. Yeah. 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 I was uh, working out of the U.S. Embassy over there, and I, I remember I was f working night shift monitoring a radio. We were in this exercise. Some prick 148 I just got, radio piece of shit. No, this was, I mean, this is soft. So it was oh, okay. You got radio. good stuff. Yeah, okay. SATCOM <laughs> and all that stuff. And, uh, um, I just got done running PT down the Danube and was uh, getting ready to get in the shower, and I saw on the, I saw the plane fly in the second one, the first one. The one tower is already burned. I was right. like, wow. Anyway, uh, you know, shortly after that, I was deployed to the Middle East, and I don't, I can't even remember. A lot of guys counted, but I never counted how many times I was in Iraq and Afghanistan. But it was a lot. Yeah, Evan did tried. You, Evan tried to put all his times together I, at one yeah. time, and people were talking shit. Like, what, how did you do that many deployments in that amount of time? Because you don't fucking, you, three, you don't, so three, we, it's our, 90 days yes, on off. Right. right. Our night, because of our op tempo, yeah. we didn't do a year. What those people are saying is, hey, if you're doing a year, you can't do that many tours. Well, we were rotating pilots. We were flying so much, especially 06, mm. 07, right before the surge. Right. That's when I was there. I was in there in the surge. Yeah, we were, um, the, it was dangerous. We were pilot, some of our pilots were flying over 200 hours a month. Oof. Wow. So we had to get them back because it's chronic fatigue. Yeah. So, yeah, so our rotations were, you know, I think I, I counted up months, and I think I was somewhere, you know, over three years deployed in combat, but not three rotations like you would get elsewhere but a lot of rotations inside that three plus years by the way 200 hours is like that's in a month that's like 50 nascar races in one month yeah that's the equivalent yeah Fuck it's a, that it, and it's fly, and those were our little bird pilots and those are the hardest airplanes oh they how did you have kids like, I mean, didn't, you know, well, like, when, when oh, two, do I need to go back to biology when class? No, no, or? no. But I mean, when I, I, two people really love each other. I, I know, yeah. but uh, you would figure during all that flying Seriously. and everything else, like that you're just going to yeah. lose all your... I had my last kid, uh, my last kid was born uh, August 21st, 2001, a couple weeks before 9-11. Okay. He's a Clemson right now. Is oh, he really? Yeah, yeah he's, a, way, he's yeah. a sophomore at Clemson. I grew up next to Clemson. Yeah. yeah. I love that. But my wife went there. Yeah, oh, Clemson's okay. a good school. I went to Ohio yeah, State. A good school. I, love I went to Ohio it. State. I apologize oh, for hey, you're your dead loss. You're to me, bro. Don't even talk to me. Disconnect <laughs> your mic. I know, right? <laughs> no, my whole my side of the family's Ohio, and they were texting me, you mm. know, not today, Clemson, not today. I yeah. Like, you know. Yeah, I'm, yeah. Hey, look, it, so everybody needs a little air let out of their tires periodically. Oh, <laughs> uh, look. I, look, Cle you can let Clemson's a lot out a, of this asshole's tires. Yes, uh, yeah, of course. And, but, but Clemson's got a great team coming in, too. So yeah. does Ohio they State. It's going to be the same three teams. Yes. I'm yes. a fan of Dabo Sweeney. I think he's a great leader, and I think people really respond to his leadership. He's, so. they he, do. He, he's been here lately giving people a little bit too much bulletin board material. He should probably calm down a little bit. Mm. But yeah, internally, I, I, hear from, I hear from the guys, like his team loves him. Loves him. Which is a big deal. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like yeah. Saban's guys love him, and that's why when, when Saban goes to recruit people – he, he gives them the whole Alabama spiel and the same thing with uh, Dabo as well. Yeah. But the real recruitment happens on social media when those kids reach out to people that are on Clemson and on Alabama. It's like, hey, what's it really like? Yeah, like you want to fucking, yeah. you wanna fucking yeah. win? Come play here. Yeah. yeah, That's how it really works, right? It's a great stadium and a, and a great atmosphere. Death Valley. Yeah. Death Valley. Right? Love I'm it. sure your, Love your boy's it, having a blast down there. It's not he too is. fun early in, the se in early September when it's so hot as fuck there. Yeah. No, it is not fun. Yeah. As the months progress in October and November, it's pretty nice. There, it, right? it, it's it is, it's yeah. amazing. Um, and I saw Dave Matthews there one time. Did you really? Yeah. Big fan. Big well, fan. I'm not, but <laughs> no. I know uh, you the are. The drugs you were on, I know. Yeah, you, uh, I know you enjoyed them that night. You just got to switch the drugs up, yeah. Uh, after 9-11, did you know you were going back to Iraq? Uh, no, Iraq happened in 03, right? Mm -hmm. So I did a couple of tours in Afghanistan. Um, but there was, al there was already a lot of Well, there was obviously before... Iraq, right? uh, the invasion of Iraq happened. There was planning, and we yeah. knew in advance. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, eventually I knew. Um, I was in the 160th at the time. And, um, yeah, they, I mean, we knew. And, they, you know, I'll never forget my boss went over with the initial wave. Uh, was in Baghdad in May of uh, 03. Wow. And uh, around, or no, he was in in, like, February or mm -hmm. something. They started Saudi, then they went up into mm -hmm. Iraq. And uh, in May, he said, hey, you need to come over. I was the XO of uh, 1st Battalion, 160. He said, you need to come over here 
relieve me or we're going to get all of our stuff out of here. We'll be out of here in three weeks. And he said, I just need you to get property accountability and all oh, that yeah, stuff. Yeah. And I was like, all right, I wanted to get over there anyway. Bait yeah. and switch. Mother yeah, I got over there. That, like in August, I was like, dude, we're not leaving here. I mean, we're going to be here for a yeah. while. So we had skinnied down our numbers of airplanes, and we mm. built them right back up again. And, you know, General McChrystal had just taken over at the time, a, a great leader. Yes. Uh, and uh, he – and A little too trusting sometimes, he, but he's, yeah, a, he's, he's a good man, and he's a very good fucking I, uh, I, I I worked under two great leaders mm. the, that stand out more than that, but really two uh, in combat as a younger officer, and that was uh, – uh, Stan McChrystal and Bill McRaven. Mm -hmm. a big fan. Everybody likes Bill McRaven too. That fucking get up and make your bed. Make your bed. I wish deal. my boys would watch that. They don't make their bed now. <laughs> I don't so. make my bed for the same reason I don't tie my shoes when I take them off. You understand? You it's, tie your shoes. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Why make the bed? I'm getting back in there as soon as I can. That's a joke from some comedian. I don't remember who it is. Yeah, and, and the shoes Gaffigan, thing, everybody's making the shoes now. Where you hey, don't, listen, you don't I know. That's 40 yeah. years. I'm institutionalized. I yeah, make you my are. bed You're every done. day. I make my bed when I get up in a hotel room, for God's sake. That's <laughs> unacceptable. Like you got to get, grow a beard and get over that bullshit. It's been two years you've been out now. Come on. <laughs> yeah, grow more, almost two and a half. Grow yeah. the freedom rug and start. Uh, hey, I tried to grow a beard. It just wasn't pretty. He can't do it. I can't do it. He's sweet mustache. So. I have sweet mustache, but that's yeah. that's yeah, about yeah, it. No, that's that's not my DNA. I'm just uh, even trying to keep what I got, which I'm <laughs> losing mightily. Keeps.com, yeah. four yeah. slash drinking bros. Boom, that's right. boom. Keeps.com. Keeps there you it's a, it actually doesn't work. It does. Uh, uh, Bobby, you can pull that picture off the screen, by the way. Yeah, um, what the hell? Uh, real, real quick here. Uh, oh, did screen. you think we would be in Iraq that long? Like, are, are you surprised um, that we're still in the Middle East all these years later? Am I, and so again, I'm talking my personal opinion right. here. Yes. I, you know, I, maybe I was initially, but now, in fact, we just had this conversation over lunch. I was at lunch downtown uh, with some friends and we had this discussion. You know, um, I think when we go into a country like we did Iraq or Afghanistan and we basically, you know, take over the place, I think we have to be set for a long-term commitment. If you look, South Korea, Korea Peninsula is a perfect example. We're still there, I mean, right? We're still in Europe. Yeah, well, we're still in Europe. But they're, you know, a little bit in Afghanistan. Yeah. But the Marshall Plan took, what, 12 full years of on hand, like hands-on right. And that's stuff. it. You've yeah. got to be in it for the long haul. It doesn't mean you've got to stay at the same troop levels. Mm -hmm. But for Afghanistan, they had really no functioning government. You know, they, right. the Taliban shut down the schools, so just finding someone in the early years who could read and write was like a major victory. Yeah. Same thing with Iraq, though. You had to go outside for yeah, people. Yeah, Iraq better. was a little better. Their infrastructure's better. Their the terrain is better, flatter. Yeah. Yeah. They had more money. But we had to go. That One of the problems that we, we found was that we had to go outside of Iraq to people that have had to flee the place right, to find right. smart people that could leave government. But when they came back, the people that had stayed there were like, fuck you guys, you left. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know I, mean? I, it was. It's a yeah. super complex situation. Is why we shouldn't have gotten involved. In well, the first yeah, place. and the question is, did you know the Bathus? We kicked him out of government. Was that a smart move? I, I don't mean, know. Look, it certainly took longer because we did that. If so. if even during uh, the the Kuwait thing, the Gulf Gulf War situation, Syria. I mean, that was still Al Assad back then, right? Yeah, yeah. Still the Bath the Party. The older, the father, right? Yeah, it was the, but, father. but yeah. they were still Bath Party guys. And they went against Saddam, who was also a Bath Party guy, because they didn't want to get involved in that bullshit. Right. There was yeah. a way to handle this without fucking up Syria as it was and, and all this stuff. But now, this, the situation now is we're, we're essentially paying and, and training and arming ISIS and Al Qaeda in Syria to fight against the Syrian government the same way we did the Mujahideen back in the day. Now, that doesn't necessarily make it. ISIS and Al Qaeda, we think of as these people are intrinsically evil. Mostly they're poor, right? right? And they have nothing to do and they have no education and they don't know that there's a better life somewhere. Same thing with the Mujahideen back in the day. All they know is somebody's trying to fuck with their, their people and they want to stop it. Mm -hmm. And they'll, they'll allow any ally that's going to help them to come in. When we didn't build schools in Afghanistan, after the Soviet Union fell. That was a huge mistake. We cost ourselves a lot of American lives by not doing that shit. And by- uh, The by Taliban allowing, took yes, over before exactly. we came in here. Well, by, by allowing all those madrasas to get set up and all the warlords yeah. to take control, we fucking ruined our, any chance of Afghanistan yeah. having a yeah. good future, really. Yeah, I think if we had a do-over that we would have changed the fourth quarter play on, yes. uh, in Afghanistan. But I will say that we opened up schools right after we got in there post 9-11. Yep. And I saw sort of a turning of the ship to the better with Afghanistan. And mm -hmm. it looked they got a long way to go, and there's a lot of things that could happen. Sure. But when you started seeing uh, kids graduate high school, 
then you started seeing Especially more women. of a, yeah, women, young I mean, girls graduating high yeah, school. Yeah, I mean, remember they had no no schools whatsoever. No. no, you know. So now I think you've got a brighter future. Yep. Is it is it a lock? Certainly not. But it's you know it's better. But again, you know, I think you got to be in it for the long haul. You got to go in it, and that and that's probably not politically acceptable to the to the American people. Mm -hmm. If you guys say, hey, so you're telling me if we go into Iraq, we're going to be there 50 years? Right. I mean, think about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not yeah. a way you want to win popular support. But that's the reality. But it is I think. reality. It could yeah. be. It certainly could be depending on the country. And each country is different. But, you know, Afghanistan, you got to build all those basic government institutions. People think democracies are like a panacea. You know, you drop one in there and everything's <laughs> rosy. Well, they're not. There's a lot of opportunities for abuse and things like that. And you got to have strong institutions inside that democracy mm -hmm. to make sure that, you know, the people are taken care of right. and that things are on the up and up. And that takes time. Translating ethics cross culture, right? Yes. So very here, difficult here, here in America. If you and I have if, if I'm your boss, I'm your mm -hmm. leader, I might use some strong language to motivate you at some point. If I'm your boss in Iraq, I'm going to slap you in the face. Like that's just how it is. I think that's a good day. Yeah. In the face. Like it, no, I mean, that, that's just, that <laughs> yeah. is, that's literally par for the course. So if you're a, if you're a police officer in Iraq and some kid, uh, is like 15, 16 year old kid who's acting like an asshole on the street, you grab him by the collar and slap the shit out of him a bunch of times, give yeah. him a bloody yeah. nose at a black guy and send him home. Now, yep. obviously that's not something that I agree with, but that is the culture over there. And it's not about yeah. whether it's right or wrong. It's about that it is. It exists. And that's something that we have to fucking deal with. Well, you know, when we go into a country, when you commit military force, you got, you know, and I know our senior leaders understand this, um, but it's going to cost lives. And, you know, the uh, ultimately there's going to be casualties. And, you know, when I was the 160th commander, uh, we have a, you know, and I don't know if there's a picture you can find on the internet, but there's a black memorial in front of the 160th headquarters. It's the Night Stalker Memorial. Yeah, see, see if you can pull that up, Hubba. And uh, and it's a black granite wall. There it is. Oh, that's yeah. that's dope. Sure. Uh, and on that name, on that are etched the names and the dates of all of our fallen. That's an older picture there, but it's still good. We had to add space to that. Right, because uh, we were, you could see we're running out of space. Right. Yeah. Well, behind each of those names is a family. Right. 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 There's uh, a lot of them are wives and kids whose lives were changed in a blink of an instant or a blink of an eye, and uh, or mothers and fathers. You know, I tell my kids, hey, listen, the rule here is uh, parents don't bury kids; kids bury right. parents. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, but that's not the case here. So when I retired, you know, I went to the uh, I. I was had the opportunity to take over the Special Ops Warrior Foundation uh, from Vice Admiral Joe, Re Vice Admiral retired Joe McGuire, Navy SEAL, and I've been at that for two and a half years. But a lot of those names you see on that wall, and like memorials from all the different soft units, Rangers, SF, SEALs, uh, we take care of those kids. We start educating them uh, in preschool. We pay for it. And we continue paying for unlimited tutoring in college or any kind of trade school, anything they want to do. Uh, yeah, I, I was trying time. to find a close up on my own computer there. Uh, how many names would you say is? On I don't. There, I, I'm, I'm a, I haven't been up there for years. When I change command, I try to let the new guys run their op the way they're supposed to. But I think we're over 90 names on that wall now. Okay. Um, and that's just Night Stalkers. That's just one. That's just they service the entire. Special operations. Yeah, we fly know. everybody. That's again, that's an older picture. Now, if you look underneath those three granite slabs, there's now a black base, and there's names along that. That there, there's names along that. Mm. That's why we created oh, that. Um, and, and and forgive me, where is this located? That's that Fort memorial. Campbell. There's Fort Campbell, Kentucky, right in front of the regimental headquarters. Okay. So and we hold memorials every year on the date we lose them. The unit, the company, platoon, they come out and have a toast. That's at our annual memorial ceremony that we do every year. We bring all the families back. They're invited back to come uh, spend time on the compound. So the Special okay. Operations Warrior, Warrior Foundation. Foundation, what you do is identify the, the family members, uh, whether it's a spouse or the children of KI service members in the, uh, in the soft community, and then you make sure they get a career. No, what, what we do is we, we got two missions. We mm. fund the education of the right. children of fallen special ops personnel okay. and the children 
of living and deceased Medal of Honor recipients. Mm, okay. mm. So we've got, right now, I think we have about 17 Medal of Honor recipient kids in our program. We have 970 kids total. Our programs start with funding preschool, unlimited tutoring, college visits, college preparation courses, and fully funding post-secondary education to include study abroad and internship. And we don't care if they go to a trade school to become a welder or a plumber, right. that's great. If they go to Harvard, we fund that. We don't ask them to go to any other charities. We actually proactively reach out to the family within 60 days of the loss of their loved one. We ask them to fill out a contact form essentially, and they're in the program. No other applications, no nothing. We have a special needs program uh, that addresses, uh, we have a small number of kids, 15 to 20, that uh, some will never attend college. So we were committed to supporting their education as well. We, um, you know, now you think about these kids. These are kids most likely in a single parent home, right? Mm -hmm. So they've lost a parent mm -hmm. in a very traumatic way. I told you, blink of an eye. Or you with open their a door, there's a, a chaplain there. Yeah. yeah. A lot or, of the time it's their grandparents that, that are older and have no idea how to raise a fucking kid again. Yeah, sure. they lose too. And yeah. sometimes the it spouse. It happens a lot. Yeah, yeah, we've had several cases where the one is killed and the other ends yep. up dying shortly thereafter. Well, so you get these kids. I think anybody would say, well, they're probably a high risk group, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, for, Absolutely for are, yeah. pursuing uh, post-secondary education. Last year, we had 41 kids graduate high school. 38 went right into college. Two joined the Army, and one took a year off. 30% above the national average. Same year last year, 93% of our kids graduated college with a degree on time. That's amazing. Over 30%. Likely single parent, not all, mm -hmm. but likely single mm -hmm. parent. And to have that success, and I believe... And I take no credit for this. It's the counselors. We got six counselors on. We got, we're only 16 people. But they start that relationship in the beginning, in, in preschool sometimes. And it continues. The average age of the kid coming into our program is seven. Well, that's a, that, this is a good note for parents out there. So I hel helped with a study that was done in California by a teacher's union, actually, back in the day. They were trying to figure out different pathways and points of interdiction where kids were failing. Why were they failing? The only thing that they found, regardless of race, ethnicity, even legal immigration status, uh, gender, income, any of that shit, which school district they went to, the only thing that really mattered that made a difference was daily adult involvement yes. in their education outside I of the classroom. 100% agree that. So not just the teacher, but another adult outside the classroom, yep. whether it's a parent or a fucking uncle, a big brother, yep. one of their counselors, whomever mm -hmm. it is, getting involved in that kid's life and demonstrating yep. to them that they can do it because they feel like they can't a lot, right? And look, it's a game changer. Yeah. It's a game changer for those kids. It's and if something happened to me, I'd want them to do that. And we, and we, uh, we also uh, provide immediate financial assistance to severely wounded, injured, or ill special ops personnel. Right. So we overnight them a check for up to 5K. Mm -hmm. uh, overnight it. Mm. Just, you know, hey, uh, fly mom in to watch the kids so you can be right. with their... And severe, we, de we define severely wounded, ill, or injured as inpatient hospitalization, right? So not, not stitches, right. you know, or anything like that. But, and, but we, do that, we do that frequently. And we just... Uh, in fact, while I was out here, I got notified. If you're familiar with Charity Navigator, it's the mm -hmm. watchdog group. Mm -hmm. yep. So the highest rating you can get on Charity Navigator is a four-star rating. We just had our 15th year. Our overhead is less than 5%. So, you know, we're committed to good stewardship of the resources uh, when he, that we're when, provided. When he says their overhead is less than 5%, technically speaking, for a 501c3, you can spend like 88% of your money on bullshit and 12%, sometimes as low as 2% on the actual charity function. Yeah. Right? Now, this is the reason, one of the, uh, aside from the obvious, that this is so goddamn important. If you, any other thing you have in your life, whether it's your home or your weapon or your car or whatever the fuck it is, you get out of it what you're put into it, right? Mm -hmm. So if we, if we need these men and women to fight our fucking wars for us, we sure as shit can't have them. They have to have the expectation that if things go wrong, and we're going to take care they of They got your back. Right? Yeah, and, and uh, as you're explaining there can, there all this. There could be no question about that. Right, right? And, and as you're explaining all this, the only thing that I keep thinking is, why isn't our own government well, doing Well, they this? do. They oh, do. They do, okay. So... Um, they do what the what we uh, the Fry Scholarship mm -hmm. for for really it affects families post 9 11. 
So they, you know, the post 9-11 GI Bill? Right. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's basically the same thing mm -hmm. for the kids. What we ask them to do um, is use half of that for the first two years, and they can keep the other half, so if they go back for a master's later, they have that entitlement left. Right. Now, I have a kid, um, in the, my kid in Clemson, mm -hmm. my GI Bill, he's using some of it right now, it covers a lot of that. We still, right. we still somewhere around 10, 12,000 a year, even if they have the GI Bill, we still give these kids. Uh, right. for expenses and mm -hmm. things like that. We give them computers, printers, sure. all that stuff. Um, but I got a kid in Duke. Yeesh. Yeah. Oof. That's pricey. Yeah, that's 45K a year in state. Right? Uh, yeah. it's, it's, well, it is an in state. It's a private. So private, it's 75 yeah. oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 75K a year. Trust me. I told my son, I said, is hey. Is he pre-med or what is he doing? He's bio, well, he graduates this year. Okay, he's, he's, bio -med, he's a dual <laughs> yeah. major, biomedical engineering and computer science. Oh, that's wow. interesting. But Gonna the GI Bill covered less than half of that. It's yeah, just, why you, would, know, you go why to would, Harvard, Yale. Why would we want yeah. some of our best and brightest getting really good educations and becoming leaders in industry? Crazy, man. Yeah. Well, uh, anyway, it's just, so we, we provide that. And it's a personal thing. You know, our counselors are personally, they have a, they're very compassionate and, Every of these families, they know these families because remember we start in preschool, mm -hmm. so they sort of grow up and monitor these families. And I think it's that individual caring approach that we take for each family based on their circumstances right. um, that I think gives us that success, those high graduation rates, um, and it's very satisfying. You know, I so we have right now somewhere between 160 and 170 kids in college. And I started a deal um, where I write a personal card to each kid that has a 3.5 GPA or above, mm -hmm. or and for other things too, if they need encouragement or whatever. But I wrote over 40 cards. I mean, I wish if I was still in, I'd claim carpal tunnel syndrome. For yeah, me. I know, right? right? So yeah. that wouldn't be service of kids. Though, so, so you're thinking over 25% of our kids are maintaining a 3.5 GPA or above, so, and. and Probably a quarter of those were 4.0s. That's great. Where can everybody uh, find you and, and, and help out your so organization? So our, our website is uh, specialops.org, and our financials are on there. Our stats are on there. You can see there's a, we call it the spinner, but you'll see how many kids are in there. Mm -hmm. So check it out. I mean, there's a lot of great charities out there that are doing great work. Um, this is us. We have a very unique program where we start in this we uh, what i call is that long view mm -hmm. so we're looking with these kids you know in preschool but we're looking three ridge lines down we're looking at college and what we can do to make them successful when they when they reach uh, that stage uh, great program great staff very committed very very small uh, based in tampa but specialops.org yeah uh, and you have uh, it's uh, incredible alejandro uh, villanueva yeah ranger villanueva yeah, what a great guy he did my cause my cleats for us yeah yeah it's he's like a, a pair guy. of skis. Yeah, if you saw if you saw that shit, he's he's had your guys stuff on his cleats uh, during a yeah. couple of games over the last couple last years, two right? yeah. last two years. He, yeah. huge I'm going to see him next week. Oh yeah, yeah he's yeah. a really good, the really dude good dude. Is a total monster. He is no. a fu what is he like six, six seven eight. or something? Yeah. Six, yeah. Eight. I mean, he I stood next to him and I lo I felt like a child, Danny yeah. DeVito. Or something. <laughs> uh, now's the point <laughs> in the show. Where we get to the drinking bro of the week, which is someone who has inspired you or helped you become the person you are today. Who would you like to give the drinking bro of the week to? The drinking bro of the week, I give to my wife, Amy. And she would kill me. I hope she doesn't watch this podcast. <laughs> she, does, she doesn't like being in the spotlight. But mm. look, she gave up a career to raise our kids. She not only raised our kids, but while I was deployed, she kept the home fires burning. She helped and mentored our families. When we lost someone, she was there on a care team. She she made our formations better, and she makes me better. And how so many, mine is Amy Hutmock. How, how long has been married? Uh, Twenty five years. Well, don't ask me those questions, dude. <laughs> hey, <laughs> dude, you, you got to give him that up. I got to I got we'll to take, take my shoes off. We'll, <laughs> e we'll edit this. <laughs> no, it's twenty five. And how many kids you got? Three boys. So and my, where? So you got two. One are, just graduated NC State. One's a senior at Duke, and one's a sophomore at Clemson. So she did it right then. Yeah, she, she did. She, did she squared right. them away. I mean, yeah. like I said, if I was in charge, they'd be leaving the toilet seat up and not making their bed. <laughs> yeah. they actually, don't make their beds, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, well, that's awesome. Um, before you leave, I have an odd question for yeah. you because I, I'll probably never get to talk to somebody 
uh, as skilled as you are, as helicopter wise, like <laughs> ever in my life. Out more, buddy. Right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> we, we, we try to, uh, but uh, we're, we're here in the studio most of the day. Um, the, the, the Kobe Bryant crash that happened, I just oh, saw yeah. that report uh, that came in where they declared it uh, pilot error. Um, do you look at a case like that and have any thoughts where you're like, eh? You know, I'd say, you know, and but, uh, keep in mind, there's really two causes of a crash. There's a mechanical failure mm -hmm. and there's pilot error. Now, pilot error doesn't necessarily mean that you were negligent. Right. Or you weren't, you know, that you were screwed up. Some I mean, of pilot error could be a, second. yeah, it could be a bunch of things came together. You encountered a situation mm -hmm. uh, that was difficult you know, that you just couldn't process fast mm -hmm. enough or you hit something. You know, so, yeah, this was clearly pilot error. The pilot was, you know, trying to get under the weather, um, and he hit the side of a hill. He was flying an S-76, mm -hmm. uh, if I remember right, um, and they hit at a high rate of speed. When I saw the pictures, I saw that right away. When you see the crash, the debris field is mm -hmm. spread out like that, then they had a lot yeah, of yeah. forward velocity, yeah. momentum. So, you know, I didn't do the investigation. I've been, you know, I've buried a lot of people. Most mm -hmm. of our, you know, when we've lost someone, you know, a lot, it's pilot error most of the time. Right. We have had some uh, mechanical failures, but by and far, the, the most of them are pilot But you error. do like to look at the AAR because you oh, want to yeah. learn that lesson, right? Yeah, that's exactly. So, the, you know, all the services put a lot of effort into investigating these accidents mm -hmm. from a safety perspective. And that's what I told my guys. Hey, the, mo the only reason we do these investigations, safety investigations. It's not to jam anybody up. Well, there's a separate process. If there is right. something that they, you know, if they are violating, you know, right, yeah, if they yeah. drank, knocked back a 12-pack and hopped thing, in yeah. an airplane, yep. well, okay, you're going you're gonna to be held accountable for that. But we, we, we do the forensics on that crash so we can share what the lessons mm -hmm. learned for that so we don't make the same mistake again. It's just like we come off of an op. Right. Uh, I do a, a presentation. I'm doing one um, next week after next with the SEALs up in uh, Virginia Beach in the Dam Neck area on lessons learned on some friendly fire incidents. Hmm. Same concept. Put, I, I lay it out. Hey, here's the tactical situation. Here's what happened. Is Call still doing stuff? Center for Army Lessons They do. Learned? Yeah, they do. I know and they publish a lot of stuff, but they actually doing in-person stuff? I don't right know. I'm not, I know Calls. We share a lot of our information with Call yeah. Center for Army Lessons Learned. But to me, you're doing a disservice to those you lost if you don't share what happened. And it's not right. about poking that individual no. in the eye. It's you like, don't want put, to make the same mistake cause, twice. Yeah, because I used to tell guys, hey, look, some of you will never be in this position, but somebody will. Right. And I want this in your brain housing group. So when you right. have that, like, oh, I remember so that. So if the thing Krusty happens in a split. general told me yeah. this. If the so, thing happens in a split second, you're like, oh, this is what's happening. Exactly. And then you know how to fucking exactly. react to it. Right. Yeah. It's, yeah. Exactly. it's what it's about. And the reason why I wanted to ask um, is, you know, I, I read spatial disorientation for the pilot and all I kept thinking as you're, you're sharing your life story with us today was with all of the sandstorms and all the crazy shit you've flown in over the years, had it, has that ever happened to you? Yeah. Like vertigo, spatial disorientation. So you can't see, you don't you have lose an outside. Your horizon and stuff. Yeah. And you know, the most dangerous time when you punch into a weather situation where you lose sight of the ground, that first yeah. minute is critical. You have to commit to the instruments. You just have to start a climb. Unfortunately, mm. it looked like, again, I wasn't there, obviously, I didn't, but that he was going into rising terrain, mm -hmm. into a hillside. He was. I, yeah. I know that area actually very well. Yeah. Um, so that's, you know, that, so he's in a bad situation. He gets under a cloud. He's going yeah. into terrain. He, he seemed to be going really fast. And well, I've flown an F-76 before. They're a slick airplane. I mean, they're they are fast. Well, it's the, reason, it's the reason why the towers t tell them not to fly in the first place, probably, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, and, you know, hey, look, you're paid to get the job done. You're yeah, not paid yeah. to cancel for weather. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So, and, yeah. I, and, and, you know, so, so it's pretty rare mm -hmm. that things like this happen. Frankly. Yeah, to, to yeah, cap actually, it off, has that happened to you? Were, where, you, were you close? Yeah, I, I really bounced, like in Desert Storm, I bounced off the desert floor. Oh, shit. I had my head down. The other guy was flying. I was working on a nav computer. My crew chief, who is a good friend of mine to this day, 
yelled check altitude. I looked up on my FLIR screen, and we have a radar altimeter, which is absolute altitude above the ground. Right. Uh -huh. It said zero. I just reached <laughs> oh, up. No. I just Grabbed reached up with one. I pulled up my collective as we yeah. hit the ground and blew up in a sand a cloud of dust. Holy shit. I couldn't talk for like 30 seconds. Now, what would, what, what, what blew, can, split the rims, wheels, r bent the antennas on the bottom of the airplane. What's that phrase? You couldn't fit a greased BB up your butthole at that point, right? Yeah. I Total think, yeah. clench. Did you think it was over? Full clench. Oh, yeah. Well, I did. I mean, you know, I. I mean, that was how quick it would have been. It would have been, in a blink of an eye, I would have been dead. And that crew chief, I, I promoted that guy several times over the years, Good. you know, because we served together. Yeah. Did you bring this up every Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I said, hey, you saved my life, man. I got three yeah. sons because of you. Mm. I've got a whole life because of you. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm so... That's takes awesome. a, it takes a team, guys. Yeah, it does. It does. Uh, what an amazing episode. Thank you for joining us yeah, today. Hey, my pleasure, man. We really, really appreciate, appreciate it. Uh, check out his website. Go check to specialops.org. And yeah. if you got yeah, money, give it, some. Gents. Absolutely. Yes, uh, for right. D'Anthony D'Anthony Holloway, I am Ross Patterson. We are the Drinking Bros. Good night, everyone.